Welcome to Ancient Revelation, the number one investigation network. Decoding primordial secrets of the earth. Protectors of the sea, patrons of sexual pleasures, and instigators of war. They were the mighty Greek gods who were said to reign atop Mount Olympus, the highest peak in all of Greece. Their names are almost as familiar today as they were thousands of years ago. Names such as Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, and Aphrodite. In ancient times, these gods were woven into tales of adventure, heroism, and sexual conquests. Yet without a permanent home in their own Bible, Torah, or Quran, were these gods part of a lost religion or merely characters written into fables now known as Greek mythology? I think the Greek gods are just as real as any other gods in other religions. They are different, but they are just as real, and they were just as real to the people who worshipped them. The ancient Greeks, who symbolized the essence of logic and reason, also claimed that they had actual encounters with these unworldly beings. Mortal women claimed to have borne the sons of gods. Countless others testified that the gods cured them of terminal diseases. Were the stories of man's encounters with these Greek gods simply the imaginings of a superstitious society, or were they based on historical events? And what remains of their shrines and the cults that performed sacrifices to honor these supreme deities? The origins of the Greek gods were handed down by colorful storytellers, Greek art, and through the ancient poet Homer, whose classic books, the Iliad and the Odyssey, captured the tremendous powers of these alluring divinities. Since the beginning of time, cultures and religions around the world have tried to explain the origins of man's existence. According to Greek legend, the first rulers of the earth were the Titans, Cyclops, and Giants. Kronos and Rhea, the Titans who were the children of Mother Earth, were said to have given birth to the future rulers of the ancient world, Demeter, Hestia, Hera, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus. Cronus, fearing he would one day lose power to one of his children, began devouring them one by one. When his wife Rhea, who was also his sister, gave birth to their sixth child, she deceived her husband by giving him a swaddled stone in place of their son. Cronus ate the stone. Their sixth child, who was named Zeus, was saved. When Zeus matured, he sought revenge against his father. He forced Cronus to swallow a secret potion which made him vomit up the children he had devoured. Zeus's sisters and brothers were miraculously reborn. As a result, the powerful siblings joined forces to wage war against their father and his Titan brothers. In the infamous Battle of the Titans, Cronus and his brothers were bound in chains and hurled into oblivion. Zeus and his siblings were proclaimed the guardians of the universe and were given special powers. Zeus was crowned the supreme ruler of gods and mortals. He was given the powerful thunderbolt of lightning as his weapon of war. According to the ancient Greeks, these divinities made their home on the highest summit in northern Greece, called Mount Olympus. There they feasted on a delectable food called ambrosia and drank a liquid called nectar. Although they possessed human frailties, it was said they would never die. No mortals dared venture to the top of Mount Olympus. But the supreme divinities often ventured down from their mountainous kingdom and were said to mingle and sometimes meddle with the lives of mortals. 
According to legend, they took human form and displayed mortal weaknesses. But within a moment's notice, they could transform into a bird, a tree, or a violent storm. Of all the gods, Zeus exhibited the most grandeur. According to the earliest records, ancient Greeks prayed to him for good luck to take vengeance on their enemies or end a drought. Such esteem led many Greeks to claim that they were divine descendants of Zeus. When Zeus interacts with mortals, um, it's, it's primarily in the... He's, he's, he's a kind of celestial Don Giovanni. I mean, it's primarily in the form of amorous conquests. Zeus was said to have had a sexual appetite for mortal women as well as goddesses. But the attentions of Zeus seemed more a source of pride than of shame. They seemed to think that this was wonderful because it meant that they would give birth to a child who would live, who would be significant, who would be important, who would be strong and look after them. Zeus's philandering infuriated his wife, Hera, who was the protector of marriage and family. As a result, she took revenge on his lovers. Mortal men, on the other hand, followed Zeus's example by making it legal to take up mistresses and seek out prostitutes. Zeus was held in great honor. The ancient Greeks built many temples to him all over Greece. Some sites were said to have been chosen because of an epiphany, where a human witnessed the appearance of a god. Other sites were chosen because lightning had struck the area. One of the sanctuaries dedicated to Zeus was in the city of Olympia. Amidst this graveyard of rubble once stood the splendid temple of Zeus that enshrined a giant 40-foot statue of the god sculpted out of gold and ivory. The image was said to be so magnificent that it was declared the seventh wonder of the ancient world. To pay further tribute to Zeus, the ancient Greeks established the first festival of athletic competitions called the Olympic Games. Beginning in the year 776 BC and held every four years thereafter, the city of Olympia honored Zeus with these contests and with the sacrifice of animals. After the sacrifices, priests collected the blood of the animals and splattered it onto an altar Smoke usually filled the gilded shrine that was swarming with flies. By the year 700 BC, pagan worship of the gods of Mount Olympus was embedded in Greek life. The ancient Greeks organized various cults to glorify and appease their mighty and sometimes temperamental gods. Each cult built ornate shrines filled with lavish treasures dedicated to their deities. Within these cults, secret rituals were performed to ask the gods to ensure a harvest of crops or to deliver a healthy baby. The ancient Greeks were especially superstitious about the spirits of the underworld, which gave rise to cults called mysteries. The most famous mystery cult was founded in the city of Eleusis, just 15 miles north of Athens. It was here that the secret Eleusian mysteries evolved to honor the goddess Demeter. Spawned in the fertile farmlands of Greece, the Eleusian mysteries attracted followers from all over the Mediterranean. It was a society shrouded in secrecy. Demeter, the goddess of grain and everything that grows, protected farmers' crops and assured an abundant harvest. Demeter was also the proud mother of a beautiful daughter named Persephone. Legend says that one day while Persephone was picking flowers, the earth suddenly opened up and Hades, the lord of the underworld, emerged and dragged the young maiden down into the dark bowels of the lower world. Demeter was horrified for nine days and nights, she searched the world over for her 14-year-old daughter. In her anguish and grief, Demeter neglected the crops of the world and farmers' fields became barren. 
Although this meant turning on another god, the supreme ruler Zeus intervened. Hades agreed that Persephone would be returned to Earth if she hadn't eaten any food while in the Lower Kingdom. But Hades tricked Persephone into eating pomegranate seeds. As a consequence, Persephone was forced to spend three months of each year in the Lower World, but the other nine months she could spend on Earth with her mother. To the Greeks, Demeter and Persephone became symbols of the seasons of nature. When Persephone was above the earth, it was said that Demeter blessed the land with the fruits of spring, summer, and fall. But when Persephone was in the underworld, the earth suffered a cold and barren winter. This cave is where many Greeks believed Persephone emerged from the underworld. The Eleusian cult began here in Eleusis, where Persephone was said to have been abducted. The Eleusian Mysteries was a secret cult, but one in which anyone could be initiated. Ancient Greek poetry and artwork provide a window of knowledge about this mysterious religion. Each fall during harvest time, people made a pilgrimage to Athens from all over Greece to participate in a festival, to ask Demeter for abundant harvest and for information about what would happen to them after death. The festival opened with a herald announcing that anyone whose hands were free of pollution, meaning they hadn't committed murder or any other blood crime, could step forth as a candidate for initiation into the cult of Demeter. The initiates were required to bring a sacrificial piglet, which they first carried down to the sea to cleanse and purify. Then they would fall into a solemn procession, often of over 15,000 people, walking from Athens to Eleusis. Once they arrived, the piglets were thrown into large pits as gifts to the goddess. Modern archaeologists have unearthed these ancient pits, as well as votive offerings, that shed some light on the public rituals of the Eleusian mysteries. But what about the private initiation ceremonies? According to ancient inscriptions, every member who was initiated was sworn to keep secret whatever he or she had seen or heard during the rituals. One initiate into the cult later wrote, The dream forbids me to write what lies inside the sanctuary wall, and what the initiates are not allowed to see, they obviously ought not to know about. The secrecy was taken so seriously that once two archive teenagers were caught spying on the rituals and death was the result they were punished with death because it was not proper for them to see these uh, events that were forbidden to people who were not initiates somewhere in this field of silent stones is where some historians believe a large fortress was built to conceal the ceremonies one theory about the Eleusian mysteries suggests that initiates were given an hallucinogenic drug derived from buds found on sheaths of wheat, the symbol of Demeter. One of the most popular cults in antiquity, it went on a long time, and it was one of the big rivals to Christianity because the Christians were very concerned to discredit it as far as possible, so it must have been a big competition for them. Demeter was not the only divinity who was honored with a mystery cult. Greek women, whose lives were often consumed with domestic drudgery, sometimes became involved in the orgiastic cult of Dionysus, the god of wine. Dionysus was born of an affair between Zeus and his mortal lover, Semele. However, the pregnant Semele was killed in a plot orchestrated by Zeus's jealous wife, Hera. It was said that Zeus later rescued his unborn son from Semele's womb and sewed him into his thigh. When the time was right, it was said that Dionysus ripped through the stitches and was therefore twice born. Since his birth was the result of a love affair that ended in death, Dionysus became the god of ecstasy. The cult dedicated to Dionysus spread like wildfire. In the wilderness of ancient Greece, it was said that Dionysus intoxicated his female followers with wine and song. They were then transformed into enraptured dancers, floating in a trance-like state of euphoria. 
they describe a kind of ecstasy of being able to get out of themselves. And I think that is part of what that cult is. You are able to get away from your work. You're able to get away from whatever the normal confines of life are and go into the mountains and or go into the woods and, and have a good time, at least for a day or two. That's part of that religion, and I think that made it so exciting. It was said that Dionysus also had a dark side. He could lure his cult members into bliss or murderous deeds. At times, his female worshipers would be induced into such a frenzied state that they would slay animals and rip small children into pieces so they could eat the flesh and drink the blood. Men were warned to stay far away from these women when they were possessed by the god. Yet the worship of Dionysus was a sort of safety valve for women narrowly restricted in ancient life. These are the remains of the theater of Dionysus located in Athens. Here are stone seats bearing the names of the priests who were chosen as caretakers of the shrine. But all that remains from the stage are headless sculptures which symbolize the legend of Dionysus. He was said to have brought light and heat to the earth. His cult following was larger than any other. His name, Apollo, god of light, music, and prophecy. Apollo was the second generation of Olympian gods, the son of Zeus and the goddess Leto. He was born on the island of Delos with his twin sister Artemis, goddess of wildlife. The handsome Apollo was the epitome of youth. His powers were said to be awesome. Every morning he mounted his chariot and rode across the sky like a fiery ball providing energy and light to the world. But like most of the Olympian gods, Apollo possessed evil traits as well. At times, he was the deliverer of plagues and darkness. And according to the writer Homer, Apollo once descended from the heavens, shooting his arrows into both animals and men. Another interesting aspect of the Greek gods is that they do not seem to be intrinsically good or evil. They didn't start out being good or evil forces, but rather a mixture, the way human beings are a mixture with different kinds of impulses. The god of light did have a weakness for nymphs, goddesses, and mortal maidens. At one time, he fell hopelessly in love with a nymph named Daphne, who was incapable of returning his affections. It was said that Apollo chased Daphne through the woods. The beautiful nymph quickly transformed into a laurel tree. When Apollo approached the graceful branches of the tree, he proclaimed that if he couldn't have Daphne as his wife, he would make the laurel tree sacred. And so the laurel wreath became the symbolic prize that Greeks awarded at the Olympic Games. Apollo was not only known for his sexual conquests, but also for his ability to perform amazing feats. In the city of Delphi, Apollo was said to have slain a fearsome python with his arrows. The peasants in the area rejoiced at the death of the snake by making Delphi a sanctuary for Apollo. Since he was known to possess the gift of prophecy, ancient Greeks claimed that Apollo's oracle existed at Delphi. By the 8th century BC, it became an international sanctuary, and pilgrims traveled there to make an offering and ask advice. They stood in line to talk to the Pythia, a priestess who was usually a local village woman. She was said to possess the gift of prophecy and served as the interpreter of the oracle. The priestess would go into a trance-like state by chewing laurel leaves or inhaling vapors from a nearby fissure said to be the navel of the earth. The priestess would then babble incoherently and a male priest would translate her message. Typically, Greeks would ask the oracle if a battle should be fought or if they should marry or where they could find a lost child. Individual cities in Greece eventually pitched in to build an ornate temple to Apollo, although many ancient Greeks believed that Apollo himself built his first shrine out of laurel branches. 
On the roof of this crumbling columned wonder were once inscribed Apollo's words of wisdom, such as nothing in excess and know thyself. Today, little remains of this sanctuary except its majestic setting. Apollo was worshipped for his oracle. His son Asclepius offered the ancient Greeks one of the greatest gifts known to man, the gift of healing. Figures like Asclepius, whose father was a god and mother was a mortal, were labeled heroes. Many Greeks believed the gods elevated his status to that of a god because of his extraordinary healing powers. The Greeks believed that Asclepius learned medicine from a wise centaur, a creature who was half man and half horse. In time, the young healer became so accomplished that it was said he had the power to raise the dead. Zeus, the father of gods, feared that Asclepius might disturb the balance of nature. As a result, he fired a thunderbolt at Asclepius, killing him instantly. Apollo was enraged by the murder of his son. He avenged his death by killing Zeus's ally, the Cyclops. Zeus later repented by setting Asclepius among the stars. We can compare Asclepius with Christ, of course. Prophets of the God tend to be healers, tend to have the ability of miraculous healing. Um, and so Asclepius would fall into that category. And interestingly enough, the Greeks viewed him as a son of a god, but who had died at death. This means that he's a god, and yet he also has an aspect of, a, of mortality in him. He's closer to men than most gods would be. In the city of Epidaurus, a healing sanctuary was built in approximately 400 BC to worship Asclepius. This site essentially became the first hospital of Western civilization. All year round, the sick and dying visited the site, hoping to be blessed with a miracle. The cult of Asclepius at Epidaurus flourished for centuries. Numerous buildings were erected, such as temples, baths, and the most impressive theater in all of Greece, which seated 14,000. The Greeks staged an annual festival in honor of Asclepius. Athletes and musicians would compete in contests. Hotels and a gymnasium were built to serve the countless travelers. In order to find cures for their illnesses, the ancient Greeks were known to turn to a number of sources, the gods, physicians, amulets, and incantations. Those seeking a cure would come to the sanctuary and make an offering, often placing sweet cakes on an altar. Then, during the night, they would fall asleep in the sanctuary and experience God-induced dreams. In this hypnosis-like state, the god Asclepius was said to appear in their dreams and heal the person, either physically or by giving him advice. Sometimes his sacred snakes or dog would appear in the patient's dream to lick a wound. In ancient times, countless people attested to the miracles that were said to have been performed by Asclepius in the sanctuary of Epidaurus. a woman who was blind in one eye. Her name was Ambrosia, and she came all the way from Athens to Epidaurus. She went around reading the cures, and she was skeptical. She laughed to think that anyone could be cured of their illnesses so easily, simply by sleeping overnight and having a dream or having a serpent lick a wounded toe. So that night, she herself, in her dream, confronted Asclepius, and he chided her for being skeptical. He cured her blind eye and he instructed her to offer a silver pig in commemoration of her skepticism. At Epidaurus, modern archaeologists have excavated ancient stone tablets that list the miraculous cures that were said to have been performed by Asclepius. A woman who was pregnant for five years, for instance, and finally decided something was wrong and went to Asclepius at Epidaurus and eventually gave birth uh, to a five-year-old, which you can believe or not as you choose, but it's, it's written right up there on a stone tablet and, and dozens of other cures like this. In 420 BC, a devastating plague swept through Greece, wiping out a third of the population. In response, healing sanctuaries sprouted up all over the Mediterranean. 
Legend claimed that Asclepius had several sons and daughters who also became doctors. His daughter Hygieia became the patron of preventative medicine. The modern word hygiene was derived from her name. Worship at Epidaurus lasted until the 6th century AD when Christians came in and erected a church in place of the sanctuary. Very often you find the Christians have to adopt, a, if you can't beat them, join them attitude and set a church right on top of the sanctuary of Asclepius and dedicate it to healing saints so that the same activity continues. We just try to change the name and put it in an acceptable Christian form. The superhuman achievements of male divinities roused the awe and admiration of the ancient Greeks. Were the Greek goddesses equally as powerful as these male deities? They were witching warriors, sensuous seducers, and virtuous virgins. They were the mighty goddesses of Mount Olympus. The matron of all the goddesses was Hera, protector of the family and married women. She herself was married to the adulterer Zeus. Numerous stories are told about Hera's revenge against Zeus's paramours. Ancient Greeks wrote that when Zeus's lover Leto became pregnant with their twins Apollo and Artemis, the jealous Hera chased Leto away to the island of Delos. Another time, it was said, Hera transformed one of her husband's lovers into a cow. Yet Hera's powers were not limited to her husband's infidelities. On the ancient battlefields of Greece, Hera was said to have intervened often, assisting warriors in their pursuit of victory. While Hera fought against the infidelities of her husband, the goddess Aphrodite, on the other hand, became the instigator of love affairs between gods and mortals. The Greeks believed Aphrodite symbolized the essence of beauty, love, and desire. But the origins of her erotic powers are lost in antiquity. One story says that she is the daughter of Zeus. Another legend claims that she sprang from the bleeding testicles of Uranus, the god of the sky, as he fell into the sea after being castrated by his son, Cronus. The Greek Aphrodite is no, you know, a Botticelli Venus on the half shell. I mean, this is one fearsome goddess that comes out of the bleeding testicles of the sky and the spume of the sea. It was said that Aphrodite had a fondness for roses and doves, yet her favorite pastime was casting spells and weaving love affairs between gods and mortal women. She eventually became the patron goddess of prostitution, and temples dedicated to her became the first brothels in ancient Greece. I think there isn't any difference in believing in them or any other god, and it's interesting that the, most of the Greek gods stand for something. They're a rambunctious bunch, and they'll sleep with anybody or anything. Aphrodite herself possessed a strong sexual appetite. She was married to the lame god Hephaestus, patron god of laborers. However, she cheated on him often. Her affair with Ares, the god of war, became a divine scandal. In the ancient book, The Iliad, Hephaestus is told of Aphrodite's clandestine romance by Apollo, who had been spying on her. A trap was then laid for Aphrodite and Ares. When Ares came to make love to Aphrodite, Hephaestus caught them in his net at a delicate moment. Then he called on the court of gods of Mount Olympus to rule on his wife's adulterous act. Some of the divine jury sided with the jilted Hephaestus, while others applauded Ares for his cunning move to bed the beautiful Aphrodite. The affair became the fuel of gossip on the mountain of the gods. Aphrodite went on to have other affairs and bore many illegitimate children. Her son Eros, also known as Cupid, assisted his mother by using his magic arrow tipped with gold. He was said to pierce the hearts of gods as well as mortal men, and was regarded as the most beautiful of the Olympian gods because he inspired the emotion of love and softened the hearts of even the cruelest of men.
Although sex reigned supreme in the house of Aphrodite, virginity was considered a virtue and a strength to other goddesses. Athena was one deity who decided never to marry. She was the daughter of the gods Zeus and Metus. Before her birth, Zeus was informed that his unborn daughter possessed bravery and wisdom that would rival his own. Worried that his daughter might one day take over his throne, Zeus swallowed Metis before she gave birth to Athena. Later, he felt a throbbing pain in his head, and Athena sprang forth full-grown from Zeus's brain, donned in the armor of a warrior. It was said that Athena stood by her father in times of war and peace. The goddess came to symbolize wisdom, justice, and righteous warfare. Legend says that on a rocky pinnacle, Athena and the god of the sea, Poseidon, competed to rule a new city. Athena stamped her foot on the limestone and an olive tree sprang up. Poseidon, in turn, thrust his mighty triton into a rock and a spring gushed forth. But it was Athena's olive tree that would make the region prosper. As a result, Athena became the supreme divinity of the city named after her, the city of Athens. Athena was said to have protected the citizens of Athens during many battles. On their sacred citadel called the Acropolis, the ancient Athenians paid homage to Athena by building her a magnificent marbled monument called the Parthenon. A 40-foot gold and ivory statue of the goddess once stood inside this columned wonder. Every four years, Athenians celebrated their guardian's birthday by putting on a lavish festival. It included a feast with dancing, wine, and the sacrifice of hundreds of bulls. To a Greek, probably belief was not an issue, but rather acknowledging the existence of the gods. And they did this by performing sacrifices, by making prayers to the deity, by singing, songs to them, by walking in processions, by going about the very activities that signified acceptance of the deity's role in their life. They are timeless figures of Greek history. But is there a core of truth to their legendary stories of heroism and tragedy? All religious traditions have a mythology of one kind or another. Now, what's again rich and, and, uh, and, and fascinating about the Greeks is that they possess all of these stories, which are basically the inner chronicles of who we are. These stories are, are unravelings of the human soul and the human psyche. Most Greek heroes were said to be demigods, born out of a union between a divine father and a mortal mother. They were human, but they were said to possess magnificent powers. They were warriors, lovers, and world redeemers, but always under the watchful eyes of their parent gods. Of all the semi-divine heroes, Hercules symbolized the ultimate superhuman. No feat was beyond his reach. He was born the son of a mortal woman and the supreme god, Zeus, who took advantage of Hercules' mother by disguising himself as her husband. Zeus's wife, the goddess Hera, became jealous of the infant Hercules. She attempted to have two snakes strangle him and his mother while they were sleeping. However, the fearless infant killed the snakes with his small but mighty hands. At age eight, Hercules was said to have strangled a lion who had been killing flocks of sheep. As an adult, Hercules' strength and bravery stood unrivaled, but he eventually reached a crossroad in his life. One day he was walking down a path and two goddesses appeared to him and they were the personification of justice and of good and he had to make a choice between an easy path and an easy life and one that would involve being a just person, performing labors and deeds for the good of mankind. At the time, Hercules was not aware of which road he would take. He eventually fell in love and married. 
but the goddess Hera was still determined to seek revenge on him. She cast a spell over Hercules, and in a fit of madness, he murdered his own children. Later, when he realized what he had done, Hercules contemplated suicide. As a last resort, he sought the advice of the oracle at Delphi. The priestess advised Hercules that he could redeem himself by serving a king for 12 years. The king instructed Hercules to embark on a series of tasks. If he could complete them, he would be elevated to the status of God and allowed to join the other divinities on Mount Olympus. The feats became known as the 12 labors of Hercules. Among these dangerous tasks, Hercules had to strangle a voracious lion which had been devouring animals and humans alike. He also stabbed and burned the multiple heads of the Hydra, a dragon-like beast who was destroying peasant crops. And he placated a herd of man-eating horses by feeding them the flesh of their master. Hercules triumphed in completing his 12 labors and became a symbol of courage. At the end of his mortal life, Hercules had to be burned alive to melt all his corruptible and mortal parts. Then it was said he ascended Mount Olympus to join the rest of the gods. In ancient times, sanctuaries were built all over the Mediterranean in honor of this great hero. But whether Hercules really existed is a riddle buried under a sea of broken marble and fragments of pottery. For centuries, archaeologists have been searching for answers as to whether heroes such as Hercules ever existed, or if they were simply figments of imagination sprung from the minds of the ancient Greeks. The answer to these questions may be buried under massive ruins discovered in Hisarlik in modern-day Turkey. Many archaeologists believe that this was once the site of the ancient city of Troy. In the 11th century BC, the mighty heroes and Greek gods fought in a decade-long battle called the Trojan War. This bloody war symbolized the age of the heroes, or so said the Greek poet Homer, whose book The Iliad recounted the long and bloody conflict. In approximately 1200 BC, a Trojan prince named Paris visited Greece. There he met Helen, said to be the most beautiful woman in the world, and the wife of Menelaus, the king of Sparta. Paris then eloped with Helen, sweeping her off to Troy, but King Menelaus wanted her back. Thus began the long and infamous Trojan War. Homer said it took 10 years and over a thousand Greek ships to defeat Troy. Finally, the clever ruse of the Trojan horse enabled the Greeks to sack the city. But were the heroes of the Trojan War, such as Nestor, Ajax, and Achilles, real historical figures, or was the story merely inspired fiction? Historians debated whether the Trojan War occurred at all, yet one amateur archaeologist devoted his life to try to prove the story true. His name was Heinrich Schliemann, a self-made millionaire who, in 1875, excavated a site he presumed to be Troy. There he found palace walls and gilded tombs of Bronze Age kings. He felt sure that they were the remains of the mighty city Homer had written about. I believe there probably was a Trojan War. There's a great deal of evidence that uh, the city of Troy was sacked numerous times. Um, in fact, it's staggering how many times that city was, was sacked and destroyed by presumably invading armies and fires over a, a period of centuries. And to which strata of Troy uh, Homer's Iliad pertains, I don't think anyone can ever know. The city of Troy and the heroes who clashed in the legendary Trojan War are among the most haunting symbols of the ancient world. Although for most ancient Greeks, their gods and heroes were a fact of life, there are a few who questioned their existence. Heraclitus, was another philosopher around that time, uh, said, you know, the gods lie and steal and commit adultery. Who can believe in gods like these? 
As Christianity swept through the Mediterranean, the mighty and mischievous Greek gods and heroes were replaced by other divinities. Yet in some form, the gods of ancient Greece still exist today. The gods continue to exist in one sense, that we're still talking about them, we read about them, we hear about them. Particularly in Greece and Italy, we can find cults of various saints within Christianity that seem to be rooted in the very same ancient places where there used to be worship of ancient deities. The gods who were believed to have lived here 3,000 years ago still have the power to haunt the modern imagination, a tribute to the magnetic draw of the past which beckons us in search of history. Thanks for choosing Ancient Revelation your number one ancient investigations channel. We are sorry, all of our operators are busy at the moment. Please subscribe and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you.